Hey, sorry about that. I had a little trouble getting the Instagram live to start. Um, hello, everybody. This is Monica Larner. We're going to have a, um, an interesting hour ahead, uh, ahead of us because I will be interviewed. Hold on. The get a view request. Go live. Hello, everybody. Let's see. If, oh, there she is. <laughs> How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Very well. self in London. <laughs> you're, yes, you're in London. I'm here in, um, I'm here in California in Santa Barbara. Although I, I really live in Italy, but it's been more than a year that I've been stuck here. So <laughs> nice to meet you. Finally. <laughs> nice to meet you, Aiste. Very nice to meet you. And thank you so much for accepting this, uh, this chat, this interview about Italian wines. I don't know anyone <laughs> about that. <laughs> well, hopefully we can learn a couple of things together and I will share what I know, what I've picked up along the way over the many years that I've done this work. <laughs> so may maybe I will introduce you quickly uh, or you would like to introduce yourself uh, well, anyway, Monica Larna is an um, author, wine critic, and um, uh, the wine advocate reviewer. And uh, we'll be talking about Italian wines today. And uh, it's bio bio biodiversity, indigenous grapes, and many other things. Yes, yes. So I am, uh, I am Monica Larner. I am the, I'm responsible for reviewing all Italian wines for Robert Parker Wine Advocate. So that means everything from Valtellina in the far north all the way down to Pantelleria in the far south of the country. And it comes out to anywhere between 3,500 or 4,000 wines a year reviewed, which is quite a bit. Um, I'm the only reviewer on my team um, uh, that is responsible for one entire country. Uh, my colleague Luis, for example, he does Spain, Argentina, and Chile, so he does, uh, and the Jura, so he does uh, four different major wine reviewer, wine regions. And my other colleagues have um, divided up pieces of France, for example, maybe one does Champagne and Burgundy, and another one does the Rhone Valley in Australia. But I have this unique vision because I only do one country and I'm completely alone. Um, and I have worked in this field for for 20 years now I've been reviewing wines basically every vintage of Italian wine over the last 20 years I've been able to um, review and, and taste um, and I love it it's a fantastic job and uh, and as I said I'm based in Rome usually and I travel quite a bit up and down the Italian peninsula um, usually in the normal times we travel as much as three weeks out of the month. So it's constantly on the road, going to wine producers, visiting with them, seeing their vineyards, seeing what's new, tasting the wines and trying to make, you know, an idea of where, um, you know, of what the vintage will look like and what that producer, the work that that producer is doing. But you haven't traveled for one year, you mentioned. Yes, no. So for the last year, I've been, I've been here. I've been in on my family. My family actually has a vineyard in Santa Barbara, California. My brother is the winemaker. So he has been very happy. Just yesterday, he had me, um, you know, uh, helping him rack all the wines into steel tanks because we're about to bottle. Uh, he has me doing all the hard work. During harvest, he had me doing all the punch downs and the pump overs. And of course, he gave me the 5 a.m. shift. So for weeks, every morning, I was in there doing the work. So I mean, it's it's now I get to live wine from another um, from another perspective, which is fantastic. <laughs> Great. So uh, well, anyway, um, I think that Italy is often misunderstood when it's food and wine is, con is concerned. Because when you think about it, um, I think. Um, Italy is one of the greatest exporters of its food. We, wherever we'll travel to the world, you know, around the world, we'll, have, we'll find an Italian restaurant or drink Italian wine. But uh, we don't really know how diverse it is wine-wise and food-wise in its 20 regions. Could you tell exactly. us about that? 
Yeah. So, I mean, that's been, um, you know, uh, my, my career started off as a, as a journalist. I, I am a traditionally trained journalist. I never thought I would be a wine taster. So um, for me, ever since I started doing this, it's been fascinating to understand the story, you know, behind the wines. And, and for me, I very much see my job as a way of telling the story of a country, Italy, using its grapes as the narrators, as the voices, as the characters. And the more you learn about Italian wine, the more you realize how varied it is and how incredibly complex it is and how each little grape that comes from each region of Italy tells the story of that region, just like its foods, um, just like its people and, and its culture and its art and the local architecture. So it becomes a really complex storytelling machine um, this tiny little fruit, this little grape has so much to say. And that's been really um, the, the thing that's, that's inspired me the most about what I do is, is trying to use the wine to tell the story of a region. So when you look at Italian wine, of course, you know, you have this, you know, boot shaped peninsula um, that goes from the 45th to the 38th parallel. So you have this perfect range of exposure uh, along, you know, the, the, the northern hemisphere for grape growing. And it has um, something like 7,000 kilometers of coastline. So you have these beautiful breezes. And um, in ancient times, Italy was used as a nursery. It was used as a place to grow grapevines. In fact, its ancient name was Enoltria or land of wine. So you have all these different grapes that arrived to Italy from various points in the Mediterranean, and they were cultivated in Italy. And from there, because of the positioning of Italy in the Mediterranean, many of these grapes then moved across towards France and other parts of the world. But the interesting thing is that the ancients also um, cultivated by seed um, instead of by cloning. So instead of cutting uh, the grapevine and planting a new one, which is a photocopy, an exact photocopy of the, of, the, of the cutting, they were planting by seeds. And every time you plant by seed, you get the chance of creating new genetic material. And because this was such a huge industry for Inoltria, Italy just became so populated by indigenous grapes, by this enormous biodiversity, which is really the most exciting thing about Italian wine. We have, I think today, something like 400 grapes that are used commercially, but there are something like 2,000 or 3,000 grapes that are already in the registers um, that are, are, are recognized as indigenous or traditional grapes of Italy. And you can't rival that biodiversity. Um, and I, I would argue too that that's exactly what makes Italy competitive because you can make a beautiful um, Sangiovese, for example, I have a glass of Sangiovese right here, in Tuscany. But the minute you take that Sangiovese and you move it to another part of the world, of course it reacts differently. Yeah. And the expression you get from Tuscany is a fingerprint of Tuscany, of Sangiovese in Tuscany. And that becomes a competitive advantage because who else can do that? The same for Nebbiolo, the same for Nero Davola, or any of the you know, hundreds and hundreds of ind indigenous grapes that exist in Italy. And another thing that I always like to think about is that, you know, the French have been brilliant in taking their noble grapes, you know, Pinot Noir, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and perfecting them and doing enormous amount of research and important understanding of, the, of those grapes. And that never really happened to the same extent in Italy. So you have this crazy mismatch of grapes and biotypes and indigenous grapes. Some of them are not worth very much. Some of them are uh, virused. But you get wines with enormous personality in the end because you have this huge, huge uh, palette of colors uh, to play with. So it's, from that point of view, what I do in my job is take the wine, try to understand it. And then from there, I love to, um, you know, connect it to why it tastes different. What makes it Tuscan? What makes it Umbrian? What makes it from the Veneto? What makes it Sicilian? What makes it, you know, Piemontese? So. <laughs> so there is really no other country like Italy in the world. Not, uh, to me, it's the complexity of the Italian uh, co combination of the indigenous grapes, 
plus the territorio, which is a word that, um, you know, I think applies to, to Italian wine and, and the fact that there's so many different types of territories where wine is grown from high altitude in the Dolomites to desert-like conditions in some part in Sardinia or in Sicily or in Pantelleria where they grow vines in dark volcanic soils or in Etna or in um, Chianti Classico in Tuscany where you have these great calcareous stones and give a lot of personality to the wine. So you have all of these terrific very highly distinguished and identifiable microzones plus the indigenous grapes. So you get this kind of, you know, infinite possibility of taste and, and expression. So when you travel from the north to the south, uh, how would you define the wines, the Italian wines? Well, it's so <laughs> one, one, uh, I'm sure that everybody is aware of how many dialects Italy has, you know, that there is a famous um, kind of saying that one village in Italy maybe doesn't understand the language of the village next door because they speak a different dialect and this, you know, the regional foods are different. In a sense, all of those grapes are like regional dialects. They're kind of, they understand each other. They speak similar, they have similar words, similar language, but they're kind of all little different uh, you know, languages and little um, um, communicators. So when you start up in the far north, um, for example, if you start in Piedmont, uh, you have a grape there called Nebbiolo, which is the base of two of Italy's most important wines, Barolo and Barbaresco. And um, the grape there is, is kind of austere and important and meaningful and deep and complex and intellectual. Uh, it pushes you, it, it, it tricks you sometimes, it, you know, it, it, is, it is a wine that is very immersive and, and, and requires a lot of uh, your passion and attention. And in a way, that kind of mirrors the personality of the Piemontese who are uh, culturally very adjacent to France and they have a long winemaking tradition. And then if you head down maybe towards Tuscany, you get to wines that are very sunny and, and warm and embracing. And there's a thicker phenolic weight. There's more density, there's more richness, there's more softness, it's velvety, it's, it's uh, seductive. And those wines of Tuscany very much there too, kind of mirror these amazing landscapes with cypress trees and villas of Tuscany and the noble families that are very important to shaping uh, the culture of, of Tuscany. They, they're very important noble families that, uh, that ran um, in a sharecropping system much of the land there. So their imprint is very, is very important. And then you go down, for example, um, I'm doing a very general tour of Italy, but you go down towards the Amalfi Coast or Campania, uh, which is the region of Naples. And there you have volcanic soils because you have Vesuvius right there. Um, and you have all kinds of strange volcanic um, uh, phenomenons of, from Bradyism, which is like a slow motion earthquake to fissures and to uh, areas with kind of steam coming out of the ground. And these strange volcanic soils had a, have a lot of sulfur, a lot of mineral, a lot of volcanic material in them. And these wines tend to be very kind of salty and bright and um, pristine. And, and they also remind me of, you know, the, the, the lemon groves of the Amalfi Coast, the bright colors, the, uh, the pristine air, you know. And then you go all the way down maybe to Sicily, for example, and you have uh, the wines of Etna, another volcanic area, very um, austere and noble and proud wines. Again, uh, ter terrific territory to discover. So, I mean, every little pocket has its own personality, you know. And then, of course, those wines so magically, like lock and key, fit together with the local cuisine. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's fabulous. <laughs> yeah, it's the wines, the histories, the heritage. It's it's Italian. <laughs> <laughs> what are your what are your favorite uh, regions for wine? I know you live. You, you mentioned you lived. In, you are based in Rome. Will it, is it Rome or 
or you would well so rome is rome is uh, rome was a strategic uh, um tradition uh, choice for me first of all i grew i grew up uh, partly in rome um i grew up uh in i grew up in i was born in los angeles in hollywood actually my father was a, a director of photography uh he worked for many years on different films and my mother um uh, was born in krakow in poland and kind of you know we grew up in this incredibly fun uh, my brother and i fun childhood with a very inquisitive uh and you know uh, a woman of intelligent curiosity that you would only get growing up in a communist country like Poland who shows up and lives in Los Angeles with my father who was a hippie a filmmaker at the end of the 1960s in Laurel Canyon in in California and so we we my father actually um got a job in Italy uh, in the 1980s to work on a film in Rome at Cinecitta um and in fact the the Emmy behind me was actually for that production uh, called The Winds of War was a big film that he did so we all moved uh we all moved to Italy and we moved to Rome because Rome was the center of the country and my my mother thought that Rome was the best choice and of course that's where my my father's work was and over the years i've always kind of reverted re come back to Rome as my home because i have my friends there and because my life you know as, as a child was was spent there but it is so strategically important for wine as well because although the region of Lazio which surrounds Rome is not particularly well known for its wines Rome is the biggest wine market um it has uh the most availability of different wines from Italy you can find them all at the local enoteca and also Rome is convenient for traveling um throughout Italy so i lived in milano for a while and i love milano i've lived in i lived in padova and uh, i've lived in different parts of italy but rome in the end is always the core and the heart you know of the country because of my childhood and because of my familiarity with the, with the city but my 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 favorite regions i have to say if i um from an emotional point of view from the regions that excite me the most as a journalist um and again as i said my training is a is a as a journalist looking for stories is the south it's sicily campania calabria uh, puglia molise abruzzo um you know sardegna i would say the southern part of the country because that's where you find more discoveries there are more things that are new to discover new grapes you know um i wrote about my experience with a researcher in trapani in sicily who um who said come on monica i'm going to show you something get your tennis shoes on and he wanted to show me this ravine this deep hole where a grape a grape vine was growing and because he's a genetic researcher they had done tests on this grape it was a completely new grape that no one had ever seen before it was new genetic material so you feel like an indiana jones you know an archaeologist looking for these new grape uh grape varietals that have never been cataloged before and that's something that happens quite often actually in regions of the south so there's a sense of discovery that I like very much in in the southern regions and I think that gives me a lot of inspiration but I also love the nobility of both Tuscany the Veneto Piemonte for wines that are very um long aging and that also build um an important archive or library of past vintages of Italy so they become like a storyteller or volumes of a book you know that tells the story of of that region so i have to say i pretty much love all of italy um but uh <laughs> but those are some of my my regions of of interest <laughs> i'd like to come back a bit to the indigenous grapes does it also happen in other countries that much that you uh, you keep discovering new grapes and uh Yes it does. I mean Greece as a as a country even in Spain um you know the whole Mediterranean basin has has um has that and and you know it's Italy has has a lot of it just because of this this ancient uh way of you know cultivating by grape seeds. So for example um if you take uh the the name greco which is the name of a grape there's grecanico there's greco bianco uh greco di you know greco di tufo is uh, is a, is, a, is an appellation it all comes from ancient greece because evidently the grape traveled from greece and ended up in italy um there's another grape called alianico which um is said to 
mean the word Hellenic. So it also came from, from Greece or Nero di Troia from, from Troy. So, you know, they're, 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 um, there's this passage of grapes kind of went through Italy because of that perfect positioning of this peninsula, you know, just boom, right in the Mediterranean with all these beautiful winds and perfect soil types. So Italy is particularly rich in it. And what, what is most exciting about it is that um, it represents the beginning, right, of viticulture. Because when you have new genetic material, like Italy offers, that means that you have the possibility of creating new blends or new wines or new tastes. Um, and that's why it's so important that those, that the, this varietal, this biodiversity is, is, uh, is protected and kept. And as I said, they don't always result in great wines, but at least there's the potential for something new. As long as we're cloning grapes, you know, making photocopy by photocopy by photocopy, we don't change exactly, uh, you know, what, what, what the potential is. But if we have new material, we have the opportunity to change. So it's a, re it's a birth. It's a new chapter, which I find also uh, very exciting. <laughs> what do you think are the grapes that Romans, ancient Romans, were, were drinking? Well, I mean, there's, um, there are a lot of the grapes of Campania. Uh, there's a region called Falerno. And um, a lot of the grapes that were grown, even Alianico and, and some of the white grapes, were the favorite uh, grapes of the Caesars of Rome. And then um, also in the Castelli Romani uh, area of Lazio, which is a vol volcanic area outside of Rome, there are other grapes that kind of, you know, uh, white, uh, more, more table... <laughs> table grapes but but these grapes um you know quenched the thirst of ancient rome because they loved them so much and there was just you know carriages of of these of these wines going into a very hedonistic and thirsty uh, rome right so there was a huge rome has always been a huge market for wine and uh, you know the the outlying areas uh, of rome definitely kind of fed into that market but um, the ancients, you know, there, there, is, uh, there is ways to um, connect, I would say, a good majority of many of the grapes to, um, that you find in Italy to, you know, uh, to, the, to the ancient world, you know, in, in terms of what, what the locals drank or, or how those grapes got there. And, and more importantly, how they can trace a trade of grapevines that was, you know, an important trade that went through Italy um, and represented, a, you know, a part of their economy and, and their commerce and, you know, and, and all that. <laughs> I heard that Roman wine was really not really drinkable. I, is it true? Yeah. So the Romans would, um, you know, they had all strange ways of uh, preserving and uh, conserving their wines. And so they would put them in uh, you know, clay amphora, like you see in the museums, uh, many of them, you know, fell into the Mediterranean during different shipwrecks and have then since been, uh, re you know, recovered by scientists and archaeologists. And to close those wines, they were probably quite oxidized anyway. They used a lot of different resins um, and honey um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and different uh, different colugans or, or whatever they could to kind of close the the emperor and so of course you know some of these uh tastes would fall into the wine there were different herbs and oils even so now and i'm sure that to our palate they would have been uh quite terrible <laughs> not really the modern standards <laughs> not, not to the modern standards but you know maybe i'm not sure what their priorities were but maybe they were looking for the alcohol <laughs> Maybe they weren't, you know, doing <laughs> what we do today. Which is <laughs> so from, there's a, yeah, there's a question about Georgian wine, I see. Um, we've been, I think we've been, uh, I've been seeing a couple of questions scroll up, but, but you know, Georgian wine also, you know, is, a, um, I guess you could say, a, uh, an, an ancient cousin, of course, to all uh, uh, all modern wine because grapes, uh, many of the varietals initiated, you know, from the region of the Caucasus and Georgia. But even today, a lot of the um, winemaking, um, let's say, uh, 
uh, innovations, right, uh, are, are, are returning tra 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 traditions that were seen in, in places like Georgia, like the use of clay is now um, coming back in a big way, especially in, you know, and basically across Italy, there are a lot of new clay vessels, um, amphora that are being used for, fermenta for fermentation and for aging wines. So it's, it's interesting how um, you know, uh, th this is coming back. I see. Ciao, tenuta la massa. Viva Italia. Viva la pizza. It's one of my producers. <laughs> he always follows. <laughs> you can see little little fans down there. <laughs> Anyway, but I mean, so it's, you know, so yeah, the, the Roman wines probably were not, um, uh, not very pa palatable, but obviously, you know. Uh, we are talking about ancient Roman wines. Yes, exactly. The ancient Roman wines. I mean, I, I once I went to a restaurant in Rome that specialized in ancient Roman um, dishes. And of course, you know, they have all kinds of you know, like fish that has been rotten for four months, you know. The you know the gorum I think right the um, uh, some <laughs> we have oh, a somebody's asking about stemware um, so stemware is an interesting question I actually so I have now uh, this is a um, it's called a sensory glass uh, it's designed by Roberto Conterno it's an Italian glass from Piedmont and to be honest it was my colleague William Kelly who kept saying, you're not using the sensory glass, Monica. So I, I said, okay, and I, and I bought a couple of these glasses that are very, they're gorgeous. I mean, you can see that it has a thin stem and the, you know, this beautiful balloon. And I just became hooked on them. Um, a, because of the, you see how it's kind of flatter on the bottom. So your wine has a, um, you know, a flatter area to stay. And then it has this nice tulip at the top, which kind of does a, does a nice job with, with the aromas, so. That's part of my, my stemware. But then I also use Zalto. I use other glasses. But in the last year or so, I've been, I pretty much switched over to the sensory glass uh, for most of my tastings, just to kind of keep everything consistent. Oh, good question. What are the main differences between French and Italian? Oh. So I think, so this is a hard question to, to answer, but I mean, you know, as I say, I, I see the personalities of the, of the countries kind of in play because French wines have enormous um, uh, purity and perfection. And as, as I said, there is a, an intellectual need to make sure that the grapes are, um, are, are used in, in a way that's most specific to their terroir and to their, you know, to the character. In Italy, it's a little bit more of a hodgepodge. It's a little bit more crazy. Um, and you have a lot of different philosophies, one that might marry a international grape like Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot with a indigenous grape like Sangiovese. And that kind of um, became the basis of the so-called super Tuscan movement, which I, I prefer not to use that term because it, it, it seems to have lost its, uh, its meaning, but it basically it refers to wines that mix these different grapes. And then you have some wines in Italy that are only indigenous grapes, but grapes you've never heard of, like Susu Maniello or, you know, uh, these strange grapes. And so there's a lot of, again, a lot of personality, a lot of character. Um, sometimes the wines can be a little bit tart or acidic. Um, sometimes they can have these little, you know, um, things that maybe to an international palate, somebody will say, ooh, that's a, you know, a little bit bitter or strange, but it, it just depends on the grape. Or sometimes they can be very soft and very velvety and very dark, like, you know, a Teroldogo ter from the north of Italy, or, you know, there are other grapes that have kind of different, different uh, characteristics. But I think, I guess Italy has something for every palate, right? If that's going to be my sales point for Italian wine, it has something for every palate. And, but more importantly, it, as I said, it, it's like the lock and key to regional food, right? So you have, um, you know, in Sicily, you have uh, uh, Cerasuolo di Vittoria, which is kind of a light bodied red wine made with, uh, with a frappato and nero d'avola grapes. And that pairs so beautifully with this beautiful pasta that they have, that they roll by hand and they serve with swordfish, maybe a little bit of fried eggplant 
plant, maybe a little bit of dusting of almond on top or a mint leaf, you know. And then you go to Tuscany and you get these um, beautiful wines uh, from areas like Pansano in Chianti, where La Massa is uh, located, the, the gentleman that just waved to us before. And um, his wines have more robust structure, more phenolic weight. And there you could pair them with, you know, they have these beautiful encyclopedia sized cuts of bisteca la fiorentina that are cooked and are you know, beautifully succulent and then of course you go to northern regions um where there's risotto and you know there there are so many wines that uh like even amarone that um many times there's a risotto actually made with amarone so you have to drink it with an amarone too you know um and then in piedmont uh there is also a huge tradition of beautiful uh tagliolin which are very thinly cut pastas made with a lot of egg yolk um, so there's a kind of a fattiness in the mouth that you need the acidic and the tannic structure of Nebbiolo grape to kind of cut through that. So, you know, you, you have every little, every little grape speaks to its food and then you can take it one step further and, uh, and of course, talk about the differences of the territory and how those, uh, you know, those, that, that characteristic, uh, you know, soft sunlight of Tuscany, you can almost taste it in the wines or the, you know, the, the salty, um, the salty sea, uh, sea waves, you know, you can taste it in the wines of Campania or of Sicily. So, I mean, it's a real, you know, the, the grape, you know, the, a, a glass of wine, can become the best tour guide of Italy. I mean, there's no, you know, no, no, no better, no better way to discover, again, all the tastes. That <laughs> okay. Be? Oh my God. So I see all these questions. There's Tenuta La Masca again. No. Um, okay. So my uh, favorite food pairings. So favorite food food uh, um, food pairings are hard. I mean, I so a lot of the ones I just described. You know, of course, I love just a classic plate of. Um, Pasta al pomodoro made with fresh, uh, fresh tomatoes with a little bit of uh, basil. And I, you know, I am very fond of the wines that we drink commonly in Rome. A lot of them from Campania, a lot of the white wines, uh, Fiano di Avellino, uh, Falangina. I mean, those are the kind of wines that I drink a lot at home because, again, Rome is, is close to those, um, to those, uh, to those areas. Um, uh, you know, mozzarella di bufala is a is a food that I adore, but it's it's kind of hard to pair with wine just because you have such a milky, you know, fatty cheese. You need something with a little bit of acidity. Um, and I am passionate about fungi porcini, you know, wild mushrooms. And I just I'm just so happy about how you know they are just an immediate <laughs> immediate uh, pairing with any red wine basically that comes from Italy, um, especially in those areas. I see, I see Monica Vieni in Puglia, buon cibo, buon vino, verissimo, very true. Puglia is uh, Puglia is a incredible land because it is um, it is a peninsula within the peninsula, surrounded you know by two seas. So you have this effect again of the breezes and the sunshine and the heat and the warmth, and you have the proximity to the ancient world. So a lot of those ancient grapes came through Puglia and traveled up through the Salento and through the entire. Uh, heel of the boot of Italy. And of course, Puglia has um, incredible seafood, fresh, fresh ingredients. Um, you know, they have these tomatoes that are just so red and these little, you know, uh, broccoletti and, uh, you know, and uh, cima di rapa that are just so pungent and green and, and uh, very fertile soil. So from an agricultural point of view, a very rich, a very rich land. Oh, uh, uh, somebody said, I didn't hear the name of your sensory glass. It's called the sensory glass. It's hard to, um, it, I mean, I, 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 there's one person, there's an importer who sells them here in the United States. And this is, it's one glass. It's one universal glass. So there are no other models. It's just this one glass. And he's, as I said, it, it, another thing that makes it kind of interesting is that the stem is a little bit shorter compared to a Zalto. So your, your hand kind of, you know, um, can grasp it better and you don't get that, you know, that kind of uh, tilty feeling you might get as, with a Zalto with a, with a very heavy, um, with, a he with a heavier balloon. So it's, it's a very well designed glass. Yeah, Conterno Giacomo and Roberto is his son. Uh, who designed the glass with his son. So three generations of conternos went into designing this glass. <laughs> 
favorite grape, Monica? What? What's your favorite grape, Monica? Oh, what is my favorite? Um, okay, what about Catalan or French? Oh my God, you guys are crazy. Oh, so many wonderful foods. Uh, what is my favorite grape? I think my favorite grape, if I really had to say, all right, I'm going to, you know, um, marry one grape and stick with it has to be Nebbiolo because Nebbiolo is faithful. It's long lasting. It, you know, it, it, um, it, it goes, it just, it just ages so beautifully, so gracefully. It always shows a new side of itself. It always tells a new story. It evolves. It's fluid. You know, it, it, it is a grape that kind of converses with you, I guess. That sounds kind of magical, but it's true that when you have, you know, a beautiful uh, Nebbiolo, Barolo or Barbaresco, you know, you go back every time you go to the glass, you're, oh my God, there's something new and, and there's something new and there's something new. So it, there's a lot of exchange with that, with that grape. I mean, that's if I were to choose one, but it's, it's so hard because I also adore um, a lot of the white wines uh, from Italy, like um, Caricante, which is a grape that's um, found on Etna. And I love the way it's so sharp and minerally and uh, precise and, you know, again, salty and, uh, and has a beautiful uh, evolution as well after a couple of, oh, I see. Oh, Sangiovese's heart is broken. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> you see, this is the problem if you say you like one grape more than the other. There's a lot of very jealous grapes. <laughs> you can't have too many, you know, um, too many, too many partners. But Sangiovese is another grape that I, I will, um, I will definitely give a call out to because Sangiovese is kind of the the heart of. Um, of Italian wine, not only because it's, 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 you know, the grape that kind of is at the center of, of, of Italy, but it is the, it is the indigenous grape that probably has done the most important work as an ambassador to Italian wine. Uh, Sangiovese, that is the base of Chianti wines, Chianti Classico, Brunello di Montalcino, Vino Nobile di, Monte, di Montepulciano, um, and many other uh, wines also in the Emilia Romagna region, not just in Tuscany. Those wines um, are what introduced the world to Italian wine. And the whole concept of Vino Italiano is very much born with Sangiovese thanks to the hard work that Sangiovese did in forging out these new markets and whatnot. So um, a special hat off to, uh, to Sangiovese as well. Yeah, Brunello, Chianti Classico, those are all Sangiovese-based wines. Brunello is 100% Sangiovese, and Chianti Classico has a percentage that you can use of different grapes uh, like Colorino or Canaiolo in the blend of Chianti Classico. Tell me about... Vino <laughs> um. The oldest wine you've had in Italy? The oldest wine? Okay, so um, I, I think, honestly, for, for me, uh, in the, I went back, I did a beautiful vertical of wines. Um, the Barone di Casoli makes a Vin Santo, a very important uh, Vin Santo del Chianti Classico. And we went back to the 1920s, I think, in that vertical. So I think that's probably... I would say some of the oldest. I mean, th that actually opens up an interesting conversation as well, because um, for many reasons, you know, one being the wars and 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 just culturally, um, uh, even the great Italian producers had difficulty keeping a lot of back vintages of wines. You you see more back vintages in Piedmont again because. Uh, there was a, a closer proximity culturally to France. So, um, so they kept cellars and, and kept back vintages. But in many other parts of Italy, that never really happened. So there aren't that many old vintages. And it's a, it's a huge shame. It's, it's a loss of a part of Italian wine history. Um, and it becomes difficult to translate in modern terms especially compared to France, where the great Chateau always did keep a lot of back vintages. So if you go to emerging markets like China or um, in, in new parts of the world where there is a huge interest in wine, in growing interest in understanding wine, people want to be able to taste back vintages to see 
you know, the evolution of the wines. And that's something where um, Italy has not always been the best because there are fewer back vintages to offer. And many of the great Italian wines, you know, if you think of ones like Sassicaia, one of the most beautiful wines, the first vintage was 1968, or you think of San Leonardo, the first vintage was 1985. They're quite recent, actually. Um, so the whole concept of modern Italian wine is actually quite new. So you have the ancient wines that we discussed, you have all this genetic material, but then it wasn't until you know, the last 50 years or so that the quality um, really started to show and was exportable. These wines could go to foreign markets. So I, I hope you know, as a message to um, to many of the producers who might be watching or whoever, I, I always encourage, you know, if there's space in the cantina, it's important to have a library se selection to show where these wines will go, to show how they will age and, you know, in the future. So I still have a few questions. Um, what <laughs> is your, what are the equivalents for Burgundy wines in Italy? Like what are the, what, the, the are equivalents? They Burgundy wines in Italy, like very light reds. Oh, yes. Okay. So uh, that's funny because I'm actually going to do a masterclass on this exact topic um, in a couple of weeks. Um, so, it's, so uh, of course, it's hard to compare any Italian wine to Burgundy because they're two different schools, two different, you know, and I'm sure there's not a single Italian uh, wine producer or French producer that would really feel comfortable with the direct comparison because, of course, they're two different, um, two different countries. But... It is fascinating that there are so many grapes that have this incredibly elegant, ethereal, uh, magical, light side to them. Again, Nebbiolo would be one. Nerero Mascalese, which is a grape grown on Etna, is another one. Um, there's a bit of power in that wine, but again, the, the aromas are wild berries and wildflowers and, uh, you know, a blood orange and iron ore and all these very, you know, light and, you know, dancing aromas. And there are a lot of different grapes of Italy, like even Schiava, which is a light bodied red, a little bit simpler, but it has some of that kind of punchy fruit that you get in a Pinot Noir. Um, there are some uh, red grapes in Friuli Venezia Giulia, like Scopettino is one that has kind of a white pepper smell. Uh, Piedmont has a few, uh, Pella Verga is one. Again, you get this white pepper that kind of reminds me a little bit of that lifted uh, uh, you know, intense quality that you get in a, in a Burgundy. There, and, and Sangiovese is another grape that has been, has shown incredibly um, um, similar characteristics in terms of its aging potential. Um, you know, for example, in Brunello di Montalcino, there are a couple of producers that make wines that are almost, uh, you know, um, in philosophy, uh, Burgundian, completely Burgundian. Um, and um, again, the grape is different, but the end result, this incredible finesse, incredible elegance, um, and, you know, wines that are able to do, uh, to endure time um, is definitely, definitely true, definitely the case. I see a question about Barberas and Dolcetos. Barberas and Dolcetos, I'm also a huge fan of those two grapes. Um, those are two grapes from Piedmont, and they're kind of like the fun siblings, the fun cousins of Nebbiolo. Again, Nebbiolo being a little bit more austere and more, you know, uh, complicated, intellectual. And then you have Barbera and Dolcetto. They're a lot more, um, a lot more phenolic weight, darker, a little bit more extract. So you can have them with pizza. You can have them with, uh, you know, charcuterie, Italian uh, salami and prosciutto. Um, you can have them with wedges of, you know, of cheese. I mean, they're a little bit more food friendly, trattoria, uh, get the conversation going, fun wines, you know, that kind of, uh, that, that, that if you ask any great Barolo producer, what do you drink on a weeknight? They'll either say Barbero or Dolcetto. They don't drink the Biolo. <laughs> sparkling wines in Italy. So sparkling wines, oh, that's a fantastic um, area because uh, Italy, has, uh, Italy has quite a few important sparkling wine regions. And it also, um, it dances a very, uh, a very complicated uh, 
uh, uh, reality between two methods of making uh, sparkling wine. One is the, you know, Martinotti method, which would be used for Prosecco, which is a huge category of sparkling wine in Italy, probably the fastest growing wine, I think, in the world. <laughs> I mean, it's incredible how popular Prosecco is. But in that wine, it's, it's made in a, in, a, in a simpler fashion in which uh, the secondary fermentation of the wine occurs in huge uh, steel autoclaves, they're called. So instead of um, the metodo tradizionale or metodo classico or the met method champinoise used in champagne in which the secondary fermentation happens inside the bottle, in Prosecco it happens in these big containers. So Italy does both, metodo classico and the metodo Martinotti. Um, so you have this huge range of sparkling wines. And, and that's another huge competitive advantage because what other country has, um, and I see a comment about Franciacorta, has you know, a $8 Prosecco, which is fun, a little bit sweet, bubbly. It's the kind of wine that I drink very often with my girlfriends. Sometimes on a hot day, we have, oh, let's open a bottle of Prosecco and you can drink it easily without a second care in the world. Or you go towards the other side of the spectrum where you have Franciacorta, wines that were conceived um, and, and born with a, with, a, with a very tight criteria of the grapes, uh, Pinot Bianco, Pinot Nero used, um, and again, their uh, traditional method, method of classical wine. So they're made in that um, you know, um, that process that the secondary fermentation occurs in the bottle. And then you have further north, you have the Trento wines uh, from the Trento region, which are also Metodo Classico wines. And those are gorgeous because you have all of this, um, you know, you have the dolomites right behind you. So you have this white crystalline uh, mountain freshness and high altitude clarity that comes through in the wine. So you have quite a range between, the, you know, the wines made in, in uh, the Trento region, um, Franciacorta, Prosecco, and we're seeing sparkling wines being made throughout Italy, even with um, different grapes, you know, um, um, you know, uh, there's even Sangiovese based sparkling wines, there are some sparkling wines in, in, in Sicily made with their indigenous grapes. So I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a growing category and, and a flexible one too, when you, when you take the sparkling wine methods used in Italy and, and use the indigenous grapes, you have quite a few opportunities for new wines to, to emerge. And somebody asked about sweet wines. So sweet wines, and that's another. So there is Italy has a huge sweet tooth, um, and there's a lot of you know wonderful uh, dolci that we all know, you know, from panna cotta to um, you know the Sicilian desserts with the you know the marzipan and the almond paste. Or you have in Tuscany, you have the uh, cantucci, the biscotti, the dried biscuits with almonds in it, um, and you have all kinds of wonderful you know puddings and uh, sweet desserts in the northern part of the country. So almost every region of Italy has its own, of course. Um, um, incredibly different uh, dessert wines. For example, in the Veneto, um, they have a wine called Ricciotto della Valpolicella. And that's a fascinating wine because it is the same grapes used to make their other wines like Amarone and Valpolicella. And they're just air dried and made into a, uh, a sweet wine. So you have a red sweet wine uh, in that area. And then you have all kinds of, um, you even have sparkling, semi-sparkling sweet wines, like in Moscato d'Asti, in, you know, in, in Piedmont. Um, you have the Vinsanto del Chianti Classico that I just described a few minutes ago from Barone di Casoli and the many other estates that make Vinsanto in, um, in Tuscany. Um, you have quite a few um, of, you know, of pasito or, or air dried type wines made throughout Calabria and in Puglia. And of course, you go all the way down to, um, to Pantelleria in the far south, the little island, the volcanic island where they also have air dried um, dessert wines made with uh, a grape they call Zibibo, which is Moscato di Alessandria. Um, and again, they, they put the grapes out on these huge, big um, tables in hoop houses and they dry in the sun and the grapes lose, I guess, about 30 or 40% of their water mass 
in the drying process under the sun and there has to be special wind conditions. It has to be perfect. And um, oh, we're talking, yes, exactly. How is the pasito made? So the grapes are air dried and once they lose about 30% of their water mass, then they're fermented and made into wine. But because of that air drying process, you have a concentration of the flavors, of the sugars, uh, of the alcohol, of everything just becomes compressed. And they're very precious, precious, uh, precious wines. There, there is another wine, uh, which I'll mention because it's just so crazy. It's called Piccolit, and it's in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. And this wine is a dessert wine made um, from a grape that has a genetic um, defect. It has a genetic uh, uh, problem, uh, and it's called the floral abortion, in which I, I'm not sure if they're, you know, the, 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 the flowers of the grape cannot... Um, are not produced because the plant is asexual or it has, you know, it has some issue. And what happens, you have a cluster that is formed with just a few berries left on it. So you have the whole cluster and maybe like five berries on it. And from that, the plant is struggling to put all of its energy and concentration and its flavors into those five little berries. So you get this amazingly, um, dis, you know, distinctive intensity from picolite, from this, this strange grape, that it has this problem that it can't produce many berries. But imagine how the hardship of farming that, because if you were a farmer and, um, and you saw that your crop looked like that, right? You had like five berries per cluster. Why would you bother to continue farming it? Obviously, you know, there's something wrong with this grape. It doesn't produce yields. It doesn't make enough volume. So, so much of it was just uh, thrown away and, and unplanted and, and discarded. And I don't remember how many hectares of picolite are left in the world, but it's a tiny amount. And some really hardcore producers who really believed in it, and just a handful, maybe about 12 of them or so, maybe a little bit more, um, you know, make a picolite for the export market, which means that they harvest those little berries and they make this distinctive dessert wine and um, it's incredibly precious. And it, and it, it tastes like, uh, like honey and like acacia flower. Um, and it has a very delicate, beautiful sweetness. It's not too cloying, it's not too rich. Uh, some of the southern Italian wines can have a lot more sugar in there and a lot more, you know, um, kind of uh, heavier sweetness. But picolite is very delicate and, and very and, and very beautiful. <laughs> I know our hour is finishing soon, but I have one more question. How is climate change affecting Italian viticulture? You know, that has been... Um, that has probably been the theme of the last couple of years, for sure. And it's something that um, that has been, you know, as, as all of us know, creeping up on us. Um, and um, it is uh, something that I'm seeing everywhere. I, I'm seeing areas of, for example, northern Italy. We just talked about picolite, you know. Um, what is the production of picolite? I'm not sure what the annual production is, but it's incredibly small. But a grape like picolite is, you know, under attack by these changing climates uh, because it already has a hard time to produce the small amount of fruit it does. So um, how will it survive, right? Especially in a region like Friuli that used to have more a more continental climate with a lot of cool um, winds that, you know, that continue to come from, you know, the central part of Europe um, and, and cool down the region. But now we're getting warmer, warmer climate from the Mediterranean. So uh, every region is showing huge, huge, um, um, huge change, not huge changes, but, but enough visible changes to be worrisome. I mean, in, um, in Piemonte, what we talked about Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo, this grape that, you know, it, it has so much um, complexity. It is very sensitive to the light, you know, it, it, it's, its color goes from being a kind of a dark kind of ruby purplish, very light color to brown. If it gets too much sunlight on it, it gets burned by, by the sun. And of course, that's reflected in the wine that no longer shows a beautiful ruby hue. Um, you know, it starts to show a browning color, which is less, uh, less attractive. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, everywhere in Italy, really, um, we're seeing areas with more extreme weather. So summers that are suddenly hotter um, and or, or, you know, winters that are, are 
colder or rainier. For example, even this year, um, you know, I have been here in California, but I have spent a good part of this year working on uh, getting people to help uh, fix my terrace in Rome because I've had so many leaks uh, because of it's just been raining so much this this whole winter, um, you know, and that of course in the vineyards when you have hot conditions, for example, last week in Rome it was quite hot and very humid. Nothing dries, and that creates a whole bunch of fungal uh, downy uh, downy mildew, powdery, powdery mildew problems in in the vines that the you know vintners have to to deal with by by you know being very careful with their uh, sanitary sanitation in the, in the vines and, and spraying at the right time and making sure that they do all the different phases of farming at exactly the right time so it's been it's it's a challenge and and, and the challenge is the the extreme weather you know it's, it's climate change and then also the fact that we're getting these incredibly weird storms for example in piedmont they're getting hailstorms that uh, most people are saying are becoming more frequent that maybe, you know, uh, 20 years ago, a, a, a hailstorm that could damage your entire crop for the year happened once every maybe six or seven years. Now it's happening once every four years, once every three years in some areas. So, I mean, it's, it's becoming... Um, it's becoming a real, a real uh, point of concern that we all have to, um, you know, watch with, uh, with greater attention. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much, everybody listening. And uh... yeah, thank you. I think I saw I was watching some comments and I see about uh, California wines, which are great too, because my brother makes them. So of course, <laughs> But I think that, you know, uh, it's been a pleasure to share some of my, my thoughts with you. Um, and, uh, you know, and I get very excited about this topic. So I was talking very much. But <laughs> Thank you so much. I learned a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. And see you Bye. soon. Happy Sunday, everybody. Take care, Monica. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye.